So coming back then, as I promised, with uh, Tuckman stages of team development, right? And this is leading to high productivity teams. So there are really five stages, forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. It's actually adjourning, but I can't get it to rhyme otherwise, right? Uh, and so there's a small description of each there, right? Notice uh, just because the stages are here, there is no guarantee that you'll actually move through them. Some uh, teams actually never move beyond storming or they barely get to norming and go back and forth between them, right? So it takes work on your part. So I took this forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning, adjourning uh, note, and I, I, I superimposed then the PM's role, which is the same as I discussed before, but you can see as the team orients and they're independent thinkers, individual workers, they, you tell them what to do and you develop trust. In storming, you're coaching and guiding them through conflict management and to understand the mission, vision, goals in, a, in, a, in an internalized way. And then in norming, uh, you're beginning to give them some autonomy and you participate. It's a shared leadership approach. So this is really a good approach to watching your team develop into high-performing teams and knowing where they're at. Now, when I uh, work in, uh, there are other models that you could use in addition to Tuckman's, right? Um, but either way, teamwork leads to productivity. There's a Shuhari model, which is a three-step process to increase mastery. Shu is obey the rules, that's first. Then Ha is moving away from the rules where you begin to, to break free. And then Ri is finding your individual path, of course, as a team. Uh, and the Dreyfus model for skill development has five states where you uh, subsequently go from novice to beginner, competent, proficient, and expert. And as your commitment evolves, your decision making is also going to evolve and your perspective will evolve with it, right? So you end up being a higher performer and working with the team in the same way. So uh, the goal is to have as an output uh, that high-performing team, and part of that is assessed in terms of team performance, right? Where you can assess the team's performance as a whole, as well as individual performance, including skill improvements to increase competencies, reduce turnover, etc. Notice that we can have hybrid assessments of that, where, for example, an I-shaped assessment would have the team members specialize in one area, where a T-shaped uh, assessment where is where team members work a share workload and adapt to changes. And that's more of an agile approach to it. Now, here's another celebration of knowledge. Yay, right? You have the resource management plan and the project staff assignments. What do you need before you can start to develop the project team? Well, now I need resource calendars, right? These are the three inputs to developing a project team, right? I need my plan to do it. I need my staff assignments, which will list my roles, responsibilities, their skills, the training they need, etc. And then the resource calendar along with it. Um, uh, will is a, That's a celebration of knowledge. I just love it. Now, when I'm developing the team, I have to apply motivational theory, right? What motivates us? That's really uh, the, the question. Uh, do personalities, do management style, styles, are we hardwired, right? So the project manager has to figure it out and make uh, it apply and, and, and apply it to the individuals on the team, right? People mov are motivated differently. So McGregor, for example, developed theory X and theory Y. He said managers apply X or Y to all individuals, and we bucket them then, right? So manager McGregor says that the workers fit into a, a bucket X, which is where the project manager feels you need to watch them. They're unmotivated. They dislike work. They're selfish. Um, at, versus a, a theory Y PM who thinks people will work without supervision. They want to achieve, and they need freedom from us, right? Uh, why would be the approach that project managers util utilize the most? 
Now Maslow's hierarchy has these five uh, from the bottom up, physiological, safety, love, belonging, esteem, and self-actualization. We're all working towards self-actualization. Uh, we never really get out of one area or go into a next area until the first is met. So we don't go to worry about safety issues like locking our house until we have surpassed the physiological needs. Place to sleep, do we have enough food, that sort of thing. Once we do that, we go to safety. You know, do I have money in the bank? Uh, is my house locked? Do I have a house uh, that's secure? Once those are met, now I'm able to develop skills in uh, and seek out love and belonging, those sort of things. We are all seeking self-actualization, according to Maslow. Uh, McClelland had a theory of needs where he said, look, there are three things that basically motivate us, uh, achievement, affiliation, and power, right? And we're all, we, we want to identify the people working for achievement and, and know what motivates them there. Some people are motivated with affiliate, affiliation just by being part of a great organization. I loved being part of the U.S. Air Force. I thought it was great. I loved flying some of the biggest planes in the world. I just liked doing that. The biggest, the best, I, that always motivated me. I don't know why. But that's not the point. The point is what motivates you so we can keep you and make you productive, right, in our team. And then some team people are power motivated in their need. And it, this type of power, though, is not bad. This is socially oriented power, right? Like somebody that wants to make everybody laugh or somebody that uh, is driven in a time of crisis and they keep under control themselves, right? So it's not really seeking power, but it's socially oriented, right? There's also Herzberg's theory, which is actually one of my favorites. And notice I've underlined in red the H, right? Because he Herzberg deals with two things, motivating agents, and then the H, the hygiene factors. So when you read motivating agents, it sounds a lot like uh, Maslow to me. Responsibility, self-actualization, professional growth, and recognition. It's kind of a merger of several of these theories. But the hygiene factors... Herzberg says, are the working conditions that you operate in, your salary, your personal life, um, your work relationship. So what, what Herzberg is saying is, if I have bad hygiene, those conditions, we want to fix them and that'll motivate. But if we, ju if we have good hygiene, making good hygiene better is not necessarily going to motivate us. Yet, the balance is, Poor hygiene, like working conditions, salary, personal life, work relationships, can destroy motivation, right? So good hygiene is not sufficient to motivate, but it's a very important factor. And sometimes we give out pay raises when that isn't really what's going to motivate, right? A small raises. And then there's a contingency theory. You have to be the right leader at the right time, and you have to be willing to transition between the two. You might be a leader in stress, Right, where you're more directive and task oriented, but as you uh, as the environment transitions to calm, you have to transition as a leader yourself. But understanding what motivates your team, uh, theory Z is another one, and then of course there's expectancy theory. You can pause the video and review those on your own uh, now. Uh, one of the tools that you can use in all of this is to capture these uh, motivational theories, motivational approaches for different individuals on an issues log. It's the same issues log that we've talked about as a project manager that I walk around with, with actual project issues. But motivating the team and avoiding conflict or minimizing or solving conflict is also very important to me. And so you might have a separate issues log for uh, these efforts. Now, another celebration of knowledge. You've observed your team members' uh, work performance and their behaviors and their attitudes. You are now giving formal feedback to them along with the expectations and the specific goals for the remainder of the project. What technique are you using? And of course, I'm doing project performance appraisals. And you can do team uh, appraisals as a whole, 
or you can do project performance reappraisals, which are about the individual. Uh, you also want to make sure that you manage conflict within the project. In, in pro as a leader manager, conflict should be avoided, but at the, uh, at the same time, it's inevitable. And so PMI chooses, the Project Management Institute chooses to turn it into a positive, to make it a positive, right? And we can, we can avoid conflict up front by setting the right ground rules, like using the team charter. Uh, we can plan our communications, right, to make sure everyone's informed and, and, and felt heard. We can follow good project management practices like active listening and, of course, as we've already discussed, defining clear roles and responsibilities. But, as I said, conflict is inevitable, so we want to make it an opportunity. So the sources of conflict by studies are listed here. The PMBOK Guide actually talks about four of them. I would have thought personal work styles would have been, you know, personality issues, things like that, would have been higher. It's not. It's about other things, largely. And so basically, you want to let the team members resolve the issues themselves at the lowest level, unless it's impacting the project performance. You also uh, want some tools then to help with conflict, conflict management. So you can uh, there's compromising, withdrawing, smoothing, collaborating, confronting, or forcing. Now, uh, compromising is more like reconciliation, where it's a partial resolution. PMI, uh, the Project Manager Institute, would consider it lose-lose. Uh, we can withdraw or avoid the situation. It's not usually the best. It might be if somebody is getting violent at work, but otherwise, not usually the best. Uh, smoothing is more accommodating. Collaborating is really uh, is about solving the root cause, uh, and we want to make uh, it a win-win, uh, which is really a form of confronting the problem, right? That's win-win too. Forcing, forcing your opinion, the decision is not win-win. Sometimes people do that, but it's not win-win. Anyhow, some tools that you can use in your toolbox. Um, and so you want to manage the team process and use decision making and emotional intelligence as tools, right? You uh, want to develop strong emotional intelligence with your team to reduce tension and increase cooperation and it keeps stakeholders open to our project. Uh, and, and so you have approaches you can use like directing, not recommended but sometimes needed, facilitating, coaching, etc. We've discussed those. I just wanted to summarize it in one term. Now, you also have power as a project manager. And I list five of the powers that you have here. Notice that formal power, like your position power, uh, comes with generally two types of uh, efforts. One is reward and one is penalty. Penalty is not considered the way to go, but and reward generally is. It's a better motivator, right? Expert power is a very real thing. We all know that person or people we turn to or organization. Uh, referent or charismatic uh, power is um, also a, a real thing, right? People that motivate the team and uh, keep you focused. Information and finance are power, so. Okay, and then last but not least, we are in the business of problem solving, right? As project managers, we are turning chaos into order because by very definition of our project, it is unique and it is time bound, right? It's never been done and there's a limited time we can do it. So uh, we want to consider collecting some data, like uh, what are our, our courses of action or alternatives do a cost-benefit analysis, our performance reviews, or even do trend analysis to guide team performance. But when we have problems, we want to solve them by this multi-step process. Identify the problem, define it, define it, investigate it, analyze, solve, and check the solution. So, And then, of course, communicate it through the PIMIS, the Project Management Information System, using your interpersonal and team skills. Okay, that's it. That was fun. I'm looking forward to your midterms now. Thank you very much.